welcome everybody and I'm joined by some of my um, um, highly esteemed coaching colleagues here um, today and we really wanted to have uh, just an opportunity to uh, share with you some ideas around creativity and coaching and uh, just a little bit of context for you. Um, um, earlier in the year, um, Charlie from Love Your Coaching, give a wave Charlie, say hello, um, um, produced a, a fantastic handout. Well, I found it fantastic on creativity and coaching. And it really made me think about actually, how does that work in practice? What does that mean for us as coaches in terms of how we may apply creative, more creative um, elements? Uh, and what does creativity actually look like? So I thought it'd be useful just to um, um, just Pull us together to have a very short conversation about that. So um, going around, um, um, it would just be great if you could just introduce yourself so that for those that are listening and watching just know who we are. So do you want to start, Charlie, just saying hello? Yeah, hi, Charlie Wachowski. I run Love Your Coaching and we, we train people like Tim and Amanda to advance even more their coaching skills and get executive coaching qualifications. And in my coaching background, I tend to coach school leaders and head teachers. Thanks, Charlie. Sue? Hi, well, I work with Charlie and I um, am a former school leader. <laughs> My coaching is mainly in um, education now. So I coach school leaders, uh, teachers, sometimes support staff and also children and young people. Thanks, Sue. Amanda? Hi, um, I'm Amanda Clark. I work with Tim in the Wellbeing Collective and I coach a whole range of different people, mostly people who work in the healthcare services, um, but also people who work um, more broadly in the commercial sector. Thanks, Amanda. And and yes, by way of introduction, I'm Tim Coupland. So I'm the, yeah, I spoke at the beginning, but um, work also in the Wellbeing Collective as well. Um, I have a background in mental health nursing, but predominantly now work as a coach and a counsellor um, for a wide range of different sectors. So um, so we all work in coaching on a fairly regular basis, and um, and we uh, and we use a number of different methods and ideas within our coaching practice to support others to really achieve their goals and um, ambitions. And um, Charlie, your article um, really, really sort of evoked a number of questions, which I think um, will be really helpful to frame this discussion. And the article um, and will be posted as part of this discussion. But I'm just wondering, um, when we talk about creativity, when you were writing it, um, what, 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 what did you sort of mean by creativity and coaching? What does it mean for you? So, so I think what it means for me is the, the possibility of going beyond just a linear narrative of the coaching experience. You know, we, we all know well, good coaches know well, we tend to structure our sessions with a flow. And sometimes there's an opportunity to enhance the flow of how a standard coaching conversation goes by drawing in things that are slightly more, I suppose, more interesting, takes us off onto a left field, some of these examples that I, I've shared in the article. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is a possibility of having coaching sessions that aren't the standard 60 minutes in a room, me and me sitting opposite each other, whether it be spending a day together, whether it's coaching whilst we're doing an activity side by side, like cooking or, or gardening or something like that. Um, so for me, the reason why I wrote the article is I've got quite a strong awareness that it's probably relatively low on what I do as a coach. But I see some wonderful examples all, all around me from many coaches that I know. And I wanted to tap into this, not as an expert, but as someone who could try, try and draw some of these strands together. So I think that's what I mean by creativity and coaching yeah. in those two contexts. Thanks. What about Sue, Amanda, what do you think in terms of when we talk about creativity, what do we mean? For me, I think it's about um, helping people find solutions, you know, help, helping people have their unique perspectives tap into their um their ways of solving problems for me that creativity is about being able to solve problems and and i think the coaching process really helps people to to find their own solutions whether that's you know well lots of different ways which i'm sure we'll talk about you know that's for me that's what creative thinking is 
Yeah, and I, I just follow following on from what you're saying there. So I, I agree with that. It's about finding different ways that really work for the person that you're coaching to help them think differently. And whether that's bringing in things from that, that draw on different senses that kind of take people into a place where they can really shift their mindset um, because fundamentally that's what coaching is about is is kind of looking at the challenges and issues and opportunities that people bring to coaching and finding a different perspective a different way forwards and and things that people can then take back out into their lives to deal with the issues that they're bringing to coaching yeah Something struck me right at the beginning of the article, which is about the opportunity for creativity to raise awareness or to bring awareness to a situation that may not necessarily be easy to access that awareness through the way we talk or the way we describe something. You know, that idea that we have sometimes very archaic or repeated patterns of talking about certain things, but doing something creative can almost unleash or unlock something a different perspective on it um, so for me I, I, I would I would agree it's about following the direction but also sensing a little bit about what the coachee may need in terms of opening up their awareness it can take a little bit of bravery sometimes can't it to do that I, I wonder what your reflections are on that you said sometimes stepping into that being a little bit more courageous in your coaching conversations any thoughts on that well, I, I think that there, I see that um, because I know that it's relatively low on my radar, I, I think that I, I think I worry that it's that people can just see it as a technique, learn this technique and then incorporate it. I think it goes really well with skilled practitioners. I mean, I, I, I remember when I first learned to coach, a very experienced coach um, taught me this little technique, which was if you've got if you want to move from old thinking to new thinking draw a line on the floor and step over it and then you step into this new sense this new you and as, a, as an agile new coach i thought that was quite brilliant so i tried to do it in about my third ever coaching session and it didn't work well for two reasons firstly the coachy refused to do it he said, i'm not doing that and secondly i forgot that i was in a starbucks so um <laughs> <laughs> I now understand why I didn't want to do it. I, I get that now. So I, I, over the years, I've learned, okay, that there's that terrible warning in my head that, that being creative, it might feel like a stretch, um, but it does, it's not outside of the skills of, as you said, Tim, hearing who the person is, careful listening, understanding who might respond to something, might, might respond to you getting a toy out or respond to you um, asking them to draw something or something of that nature. Mm. yeah and that's that whole idea of might respond but they don't have to you know somebody mm. it's, it's totally consensual and equal in that sense isn't it um and so what, what do you what, what comes to your mind uh, uh, amanda and see when we're thinking about courage and creativity it, it's interesting i think it depends very much on the coachee so you know i can think of a particular coachee that i worked with who describe themselves as being very visual so actually working with Im images didn't seem to be a courageous thing to do at all it seemed to be a very natural fit I th but I also think there's something about how creative or not we as coaches are and how creative or not the coach he is and kind of what what that combination leads to it's that yeah. kind of interactive piece really yeah, so sometimes a little bit of um, a little bit of sensing about what's going to work really well between mm. between you both. That kind of resonance that that's sometimes a bit indescribable. Sue, mm. well, I, I said I coach children and young people as well as as grown ups, um, and I found I find that um, children are much more creative than adults I, I you know I think we probably all know that you know we lose our creativity I think or a lot of people do as we grow up so working with children I don't find that I have to be courageous because they they're wonderful they just kind of go with whatever you ask them or put in front of them you know and and, and adults a, a, a bit you know different so um I think what Amanda said you know sensing what might be 
uh, sort of appropriate to use with with the adult coachee in front of you um, is is it is a challenge and i think um it's you just have to create this atmosphere don't you of sort of trust and safety where um you know you can have you can ask them or suggest something to do but equally they feel really ha happy to sort of say no i don't really want to do that or you can you can sense that they don't want to do that so um but some wonderful moments do come through as you know being a courageous coach and, and persuading somebody to, to do something like move or um, you know, or, or to pick up something and go with it. Uh, and, and, but I think, I think that element of trust and safety is, is fundamental to, to being able to be courageous on both sides. Yeah, I, 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 th I think I think there is a real, a re you know, it's part of very much part of safe contracting, isn't it? That whole sense of building trust and safety, but also uh, it, what that does also it enables um, a coach to successfully sometimes step into a situation and say, oh, would you mind if I suggested something that we could try and not be so phased if the person says, you must be joking, I'm not going to do that. Because of course, uh, it, it, it can sometimes take a little bit of courage for a coach to step up. But I think also it takes a lot of courage for a coachee to say, well, actually, no, that's not for me. But if the contract is really well grounded and, and, and well established and and there's a good sense of what 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 works and doesn't then actually it can be it can be really good can't it because sometimes a coach you would just say oh go on then i'll i'll have a go in and just and just see just see how that goes so in, in your article charlie just moving on slightly you talk about two different types of creativity so you talk about the structure or creative structure of sessions and you talk about actually what may go on in a session that may be creative um uh, perhaps the things that maybe are a little bit uh, a little bit more sort of uh, uh, visual or pictorial or something that may go on in the session but looking at the structure of the sessions um what particular th things have you done that actually are different to the standard kind of maybe interacting over zoom which a lot of us have done over the last year or um face to face what sort of things have you done that have worked well so um, probably the most obvious one is a walk and talk the idea of having a coaching session where we we stroll you know we just stroll and we have that conversation and i and i do that a lot and and i do i also do it on coach training when we have live coach coaching so we're, if we're in a venue that suits us we often see people walking around the park and having the coaching sessions and, and what i've found and what i've noticed is that people come back and they report straight away on the debriefs that it was a very very different experience and there was one head teacher in fact and he brought the same topic to coaching throughout this program which was should i leave my job yes obviously but um nevertheless he uh, he kept on hitting pretty well the same wall and the same obstacle. And, and then on day six, it was a walk and talk. And the, the style of coaching reported back was pretty, pretty similar. Um, but he, he made the decision and he did leave. And he reported back having a sense of freedom from that walking. So, you know, walk and talk is not, it's not new and lots of coaches do it. And we know we need to be confident enough to not have the... The structure in front of us or a clock in front of us um, but it's one that I really really advocate. The other one that I've done is whole day coaching which might sound terrible. I mean, so it sounds really my, scary. My, my wife goes <laughs> oh my goodness me and some people in in the sort of uh, the flashy coaching world they call it VIP days or discovery days well I don't really like that language but the idea of actually you're not you're not coaching them incessantly all day you're just spending the day together and and there might be a dog walk, there might be lunch, there might be, you know, you, you break for an hour when they go and check their emails and you do a bit of catching up. But there's a constant theme and, and it needs some very, very different structure, doesn't it? Because if we've only got one topic, we might have, to have it solved by 10 o'clock. So there's a progression and a build. Um, and what I've seen there, it's, it's, it's heartwarming and it's very rich to be able to do it. And you don't do it very often, of course. Um, and I think that people don't do it really more than once because of sense of over reliability but then they would be the two things that walk and talk and then whole day um, and the whole day can have an activity within it you know that can be yeah. um i i'm, I'm I, lo I do like doing practical things so i like the idea that maybe through the day you do some cooking together and you're chatting side by side or you're doing maybe 
if I could paint, I would say that, you know, you're doing some drawing side by side, or you're making something, do something with your hands, um, so that at the same time as you're doing something relatively low intensity, the conversation just carries on, and it gives a different flow. Different flow. Yeah, you talked about also where you may have a shared interest as well, that sometimes you would maybe pursue that shared interest together, um, which sounds, I think you referred to golf, didn't you, in the article, which is quite interesting, but it could be anything, couldn't it? Yeah, and, and golf is not my thing, but it, it's because I remember um, this interview, the sort of Michael Parkinson of the 1970s, uh, called Peter Alice, who did exactly that. He got around with Alice. Younger people won't know what we're talking about, but he would have a round of golf with his interviewee and they would play golf and they would chat on those long talks uh, between between holes. And I thought that was that's a really creative way to do it. And not every sport is suitable for that, but plenty I think are, you know, a bike ride or you know a long walk, something of that nature. Mm. What about what about Amanda and Sue? What what have you what have you done in terms of structuring? Have you ever done anything different or experimented with something different around the structure? Yeah, I have. Um, I very often will will go in into a school and I'll sit and um, have different sessions with people. I, I'm in the same room and people come into the room and settle. We have our coaching session. They will go and somebody else will come in. So I, I've got the luxury of being able to set up the room um, with lots of different things, you know. So when they come in, it's uh, it's kind of a relaxing but also quite stimulating um, space. I always have chocolate, so that might that might be a bit creative. And seriously, <laughs> that that does I find that that does put people um, at ease. I think you know, so you look, yeah, take it, have a chocolate, have a you know. Some, um, but I also have cards. So we talked a little bit about cards pre-session, but I have two or three sets of cards where I find if people sometimes will come in and I'll say, have you got a topic to, to talk about? And they'll say, no, I haven't really, no, I've just been so busy. I haven't really had a think, I, you know, just arrived, just landed. And having a set of cards out with, with lots of different types of pictures, again, it puts people at ease but it's a great way in to um, stimulating the brain, I think, into to oh, yeah. finding what's what's relevant. It widens um, the focus, doesn't it? It, it, it really does. And mm. I, I had an assistant head teacher the other day, and she she just landed, and and she was you know so busy and everything. She said, "I haven't really got anything to talk about." So have a look at the cards. You know, pick up pick up the card. You know, pick up the card that that most relates to you at the moment. And, and she picked a card and we spent the whole session then talking about um, a, a really deep issue that she had with a, with a, a friendship issue. Um, and that, I'm not sure that would have come out without, without the cards, you know, whether mm. she'd have felt comfortable to talk about it, whether she might, because she did say, that, is this relevant? Is it kind of, you know, it's not really to do with work, but actually it really was to do with work in the end. Mm. So I think it, it kind of reduced um, the barriers that actually were, were there in front of her. Yeah, it's a lovely sort of in-session bit of creativity, but of course it, it, it really taps into that, into the coachee's kind of uh, less logical brain, I would say, the more creative, um, intuitive brain. Yeah. yeah. Um, Amanda, your structuring sessions, what, what typically for you is your structure? Well, for the last year, of course, it's been mostly by Zoom, and and I think actually that does pose some limits. But actually, what have we done um, in some of the supervisions and sessions and stuff that we've had? We've had to kind of go and look out of the window for a couple of minutes um, and just kind of see what what occurs to you in that time. You know, what do you notice about you about where you are? Mm that sort of thing, um, you know, trying to take people to a different place, really. In the past, I've done walking meetings with people. And again, I think actually the fact that we're moving around and and actually generally, if you're walking, you're not looking at each other. And I do wonder whether for some people that gives them a bit more space to think. 
Mm, that's very true, isn't it? And um, there is a different type of interaction, isn't there? The, the idea, I've, I've done some walk and talks and actually haven't in the last year, like most of us in, in that sense, and have found them to be hugely beneficial. One particular person I remember who was a very busy working, um, working medic who just spent all of their time in buildings in very intense environments. And effectively, wherever I met this person would replicate that intense environment. So there was an effort to step outside of that and that just was hugely creative in in enabling her to consider things from a different way that also sense of maybe being in nature and um, and being connected to our environments I think also opens up different possibilities as well so lots of things about the way we structure sessions and Sue you also referred to being in sessions using cards and things do you use other creative aids as well in sessions yeah, I, I have like always have post-it notes, coloured pens, um, things to fiddle with. I literally have got a table for this. <laughs> you sound hugely creative, and um, and I tend generally come to a session with nothing. <laughs> So uh, some really lovely ideas. But I know also, Amanda, you also bring things to sessions as well. And earlier you were showing us some of your lucky charms. Or your yes, charms. so I have some a pack of charms. And the, the beauty of those is that they're in a little bag that can sit in my bag that I carry around with me. So I've always got them. Um, I do have packs of postcards and things as well. Um, and it's really about just testing out with people what works for them and giving them choices. Some people are very visual thinkers and so actually working with images can be particularly productive for them. Um, other people may be more reserved about kind of playing with different media, different approaches, and sometimes even just exploring that can be helpful um, in terms of unlocking things for them. So I think that there's something about working with different media themselves, but also the process of being creative may have a bearing on whatever issue someone is bringing to coaching mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I, absolutely and you know as I'm thinking about it I think about some of the methods that I use as well so I don't tend to have lots of um, aids but I will use um, I you know I have used things like empty chair exercises before I've used things like exaggerated movements um, uh, focusing on embodiment and um, the way people hold their bodies so I suppose in a way we you know what we're hearing is lots of different ways of being creative mm -hmm. as you were listening to that Charlie was there anything that came up for you in terms of some stuff creative stuff that you may have done well I, I think I'm very aware there's like, there's a whole world out there that uh, isn't my area of expertise of like ontological coaching and somatic coaching and people who really really lead on this um, and I've got coach friends who really really have invested in that like that that whole body experience and that that sense of feelings and I think you need to own that to do it well um I, I really like the idea and to you know Sue with her big talk here and um, Tim with just his smile and his lovely hair um not needing anything else um, I like. I think the idea of it sort of being easy access for our coaches. I think it's important. So, if you have got something that people can pick up, it shouldn't feel like an obstacle. I mean, for me, the idea of being able to, you know, pick up a pick up a fiddle toy because you can represent it, or or pick up a you know a nice wooden thing because it feels nice and it's, it's tactile. That's a lot less scary than being asked to draw something, being asked to actually do something. So, I think that the the you know the low barrier to entry for our coaches to be able to access it it's really important and i definitely think that coaches need to not worry if they've forgotten if, they, if they've left their toolbox in the car so the idea you know i like to have a couple of pins in my hand so i can do the, the a and b exercise but actually if i've got my pins i've normally got my fingers with me so i tend to use them yeah. um, that tends to work yeah as you were talking about that charlie i, I remember some of the things that you've certainly when when I've had training from you and Sue in the past I remember you really asking questions about I think it was about our own unique coaching style mm -hmm. and I think that that is a really important task for a coach isn't it to understand what their own style is and to not try and pretend that there's something that they're not but to be really true to themselves and when you are true to yourself I think you're true to your coachee as well and um and uh, and 
that that sets up the right environment for a really really good solid working relationship and i think what i've heard from us all is that there's creativity across a whole spectrum um, and uh, and that's what's wonderful about the application of coaching in practice. So we're going to draw our conversation to a close, but I'm just wondering, um, having had the conversation today, what challenge are you going to give yourself um, in terms of opening up um, creativity in your coaching relationship? So have you had any thoughts about that? I think the thought I've had about it is how can I bring creativity more into the virtual space? Um, I think certainly we can work with empty chairs. And I remember doing an exercise with somebody who had had a difficult experience in a meeting and we kind of set the room up so that she could identify who'd sat where and, and sit in those different places to, to work out different perspectives on things. And and actually you could do some of that in the virtual space, I think. Um, getting people to access things from their environment might be another thing to do, um, yeah. see what people have had. And, and ultimately I could send them a little pack of charms or something in the post if I thought that would be useful and, and they had indicated that that's something they'd like to explore. Some great things there. Sue? Yeah, I mean, Charlie just mentioned it, somatic coaching, and I'm, and I'm kind of trying to, to own that, if you like, a bit more. I've done some work on that recently and, and found it, as a coachee, found it really powerful. Uh, and then as a coach, practicing and, and developing those skills, I think that's really, really powerful, actually. So that's, that's my area of challenge at the moment, is to do more of that. Mm. Great. Yeah. I, and I would re highly recommend it. I, I've, I've used that type of coaching, not all the time, um, uh, but it can be it can really open up somebody's awareness to something that they may have not been aware of, of a co at a cognitive level, but certainly within their bodies. Mm -hmm. Charlie, any particular challenges for yourself? Yeah, I, I think there's two I want to do. One, one is when I've done values coaching in the room, it tends to have been using post-it notes. And over this last year, we've been experimenting a lot with the virtual post-it note platforms like Jamboard, and we like it really a lot in, in our training, obviously. So doing values coaching or any coaching when it's when we want to get lists of um, terms or adjectives or whatever, and then moving them around, we're doing that on Jamboard with that shared screen thing. I think I'm really interested in that and seeing how how that would go. And the other thing, and, it, and I think this is creative, and I think it's also not necessarily about the coaching session, but it's about the coaching relationship, is to organise dialogues with our coaches. Like I'm, I'm really, really mindful that we focus with our coaching on their issue, their topic, their life, and we hold back a lot. Of course we do. You know, we hold back our views and we're using our, our knowledge of the world to ask questions. But it always feels to me like there's a, a whole part of the, that third bit, you know, the relationship between the two of us. It could be explored outside of coaching by having dialogues, by mm. sitting and talking together, bringing a shared topic and back and forth. And I'm really interested in that because I think there is a risk of it impacting on the coaching relationship. But I also think there's a possibility of bringing in some really nice power neutrality to that. Mm. So I think that's something that I want to start offering to coaching clients, probably coaching clients that we have for a longer program, but saying, you know, shall we have an hour just where we both come together and we talk about you know, our views on education, as so I often do, or our views on the life, the universe, and then everything. I think that it's, it's not coaching, but it's with our coaching clients. Mm. Yeah, and that's just given me an idea for one of my challenges, because I was thinking about two things. One, I was thinking about walk and talk, because the um, I'm really interested in how we connect with nature and how we touch nature in our everyday experiences. And we make contact with nature and 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 that idea that when you walk with somebody, you, you, you ever had that sort of sense when you're walking through a field and you sort of pull the head of a, a you know a piece of wheat or something like that and sprinkle it through your fingers that whole idea of connecting and what people are feeling and thinking about whilst they're doing that and talking about the thing they're talking about so that's something I'm really looking forward to doing in the coming weeks and certainly will do but the other thing that I was really reminded of Charlie just as you were saying was about how we co-create within our coaching 
sessions mm -hmm. that actually we try and bracket out such a lot of our own views and opinions and thoughts, particularly early on. It, um, but actually, as we enter into a richer dialogue, you get into that co-created space. And, and that is something that I was really reminded of and something that I would like to do more of as well, um, perhaps through some you know mutual subjects and things like that education being one or working in the nhs being uh, being another so okay so um uh, uh, we're going to draw the conversation to a close and i hope the viewers or the listeners have found this really useful um and please um uh, the attached to this will be access to the article that we've been talking about, Charlie's article, but also um, the links to our various websites as well, if you're interested and want to know more. Charlie, um, any final words from you? Well, I think, as you said to me before we got going, is believe in your own creativity. Believe that creativity is not beyond high levels of proficiency in drawing or painting or singing or whatever it is. Actually, we all have our strong sense of unique creativity and actually if we're in tune with our poetry we'll be able to do something that's really powerful and really useful for them that's brilliant being in tune with your coaching okay thanks very much and we look forward to hopefully maybe seeing you again sometime soon <laughs>